and a hush falls over the room. So good afternoon and welcome. Uh, I'm Frank Verastro. Um, I'm a senior vice president here at CSIS, and I hold a Schlesinger chair, so I'm both honored and humbled to be doing that. But it's our great pleasure today to have with us uh, Adam Siminski. Adam is a longtime friend, um, an astute observer of uh, oil markets and energy markets generally, uh, a candid commenter. And so we always welcome him. Used to be. Now that he's in government, he's much more cautious with his projections because EIA doesn't do policy. I was told at the beginning of this presentation to make sure, because EIA is so valuable, that we'll either pass the hat or we'll increase EIA's appropriations to get all the work done that we need them to do. Um, when the annual energy outlook comes out, and also when the international outlook comes out, a lot of people look at it because it's the reference guide to what goes on in the world. So it's energy markets looking at economics, uh, trade flows, price bans, and other factors that influence both supply and demand. And in this current environment, if that weren't tough enough, the fact that now we have uh, six sensitivity cases, high and low economic growth, high and low prices, and now the resource model, low resource base, high resource base, it actually gets a little bit more complex, but it presents a better mosaic of what's going on. So at any point in time, it gives you a really good picture. The forecast goes out to 2040. Um, the last time Adam was here, he talked about both uh, prices and timing. And if the, you're a smart forecaster, you never put them both in the same sentence. You can do one or the other, just don't put them together. Um, but if you'll join me in welcoming uh, Adam Siminski, it's always great to have him here. Uh, we will post the slides at the end of the presentation, and there's booklets out front the way you came in. Quick safety second. I should have just done this at the outset. Um, for those of you, there's two exits. We're on the second floor. If you go through the back here, it'll take you down stairways to the alley, drops you off on M Street. If you go out the front way the way you came, it's down one flight of stairs across Rhode Island Avenue. There's a park to the right of the Beacon Hotel, and that's where we assemble. Don't expect anything to happen. We had Sally Jewell here about three weeks ago, and she proceeded to open her remarks with the statement that, I just heard you all had a gas leak. And the back half of the room cleared out, and of course the gas leak was on 17th and M, but the, we had to corral everyone and bring them back in. So, Adam, thank you so much for coming. Adam is just back from Mexico, so if he lapses into Spanish, you'll know why that is. Um, but welcome and terrific. Gracias. Terrific. Gracias. <laughs> <laughs> Poquito. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. A little closer. How's that? Great. Okay. Say again? Gas leak. Gas leak. No, it's uh, not a, geez, you know. electronic leak. Okay. Frank, thank you very much. <laughs> the, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be back here at CSIS. Frank spared you. The last time I was over here in this room, uh, Frank said that uh, Adam used to be a, one of the senior advisors at CSIS, and he's only one policy remark away from returning. So we'll try to limit the policy remarks. Um, the trends in the 2015 uh, outlook, the annual energy outlook, which I, I keep thinking we should rename for the U.S. annual energy outlook to distinguish it from the international energy outlook, uh, is, uh, is out. We're on a two-year release cycle. So those six cases that you mentioned, the reference case, high and low, um, oil prices, high and low economy, and the uh, high resources case are actually a, a cut down right. from even more cases that we would typically run in the annual energy outlook. And the reason uh, that there's just a fewer uh, number of cases is we are trying to actually redeploy some of the resources, the people, time, uh, and so on, uh, to the international outlook, uh, which uh, I think everybody at EIA believes is, is critically important. I mean, obviously, we want to cover the domestic situation really well, uh, but you can't really understand uh, the energy outlook for the United States if you don't have a pretty good idea of what's going to happen uh, around the world. Uh, so uh, we, uh, the documentation uh, for 
uh, all of this uh, will be uh, completed in the full years of the, uh, the annual energy outlook. So next year, we'll have the complete set of everything. Uh, the, the value in running, uh, even the cases that we, the, we do in the AEO, uh, essentially involve the, the ability to use a, a reference case to assess policy. So we're not going to make policy. We're not going to uh, um, have recommendations on policy. But policy makers uh, can start uh, with the data and analysis in the annual energy outlook uh, as, a, uh, as a good uh, point to begin uh, what they're looking at. So let's see if this works. There we go. So let's uh, talk about some of the key results. And I'm going to try to go through this, uh, the first few slides, uh, pretty quickly uh, in order to get to, to some of the details that are behind these summary results. So this is the summary. Call, think of this as being the executive summary. Uh, in uh, most of the AEO 2015 cases, um, the U.S. becomes a net energy uh, uh, exporter or our our net energy imports really decline and end. Uh, this screen says by 2030, but most of the heavy lifting, as you'll see in, in a diagram in just a little bit, uh, happens uh, in the years after 2020, so early in the, the next decade. Uh, the underline on this is energy in total, not oil. We'll, we'll get into the oil issue, uh, but so going down the list. Uh, strong growth in domestic uh, production of crude oil and limited growth in demand leads to a decline in uh, net petroleum imports. So we don't become a net uh, petroleum exporter uh, in total, uh, but the numbers stay fairly low. Uh, the U.S. does indeed become a net exporter of natural gas, and that's fairly soon uh, in this outlook in the year 2017. Uh, energy consumption, so looking at this from the demand side, grows at a fairly modest rate uh, over the entire projection period. A lot of that has to do with a uh, less energy intensive uh, economy driven by technology and uh, some of the existing laws and regulations like fuel efficiency standards for automobiles. Uh, renewables provide an increasing uh, share of electricity generation. Uh, even uh, with uh, plenty of availability of natural gas, uh, the growth in renewables is fairly strong. Uh, looking at uh, a few other of the key results, improved efficiency of energy consumption uh, in, uh, across the end use sectors shifts away from carbon intensive fuels. Uh, both uh, combined to stabilize uh, carbon dioxide emissions that remain below the 2005 level of about 6 billion metric tons uh, in the year 20. Uh, that was in 2005, all the way out through the forecast period to 2040. Uh, growth of domestic crude oil and natural gas production varies significantly across the region, so a lot of growth in the Dakotas, rock, uh, the 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 uh, mid-continent area as well as uh, the Gulf Coast uh, for oil and uh, natural gas in Pennsylvania and Ohio and the Marcellus and Utica. Uh, all of that suggests the need for infrastructure uh, changes uh, to uh, deal with uh, that growth in production. And uh, final, uh, just kind of word, uh, this uh, annual energy outlook does not, NOT, include the um, clean power plan, uh, the EPA 111 B and D rule that's being considered. Uh, we uh, will have a separate report on that out uh, probably in May. Uh, and it's, since it's not part of the existing law and regulation and, and because it's complicated, we wanted to get the reference case of the annual energy outlook out first. Okay, let's uh, go on to just a few other things uh, here in the summary of the summary. Uh, here's 
Uh, one comparison between last year's annual energy outlook and this year's, uh, I won't show too many of these because what we really like to concentrate on is what's in the reference case and the side cases rather than constantly making comparisons to prior annual energy outlooks, but we thought this one was really, really important, one of the big changes and one of the reasons why it took longer than we thought to get the annual uh, energy outlook done. Uh, was partway through uh, the modeling period. We had a big change in the crude oil price uh, outlook and, and general situation. So we have significantly lower prices in the near term in the AEO 2015 for crude oil. Uh, but as you can see in that uh, graph, uh, by the time we get to 2040, uh, we're uh, back pretty much to where we were uh, in the 2014 AEO. The, uh, this uh, chart uh, shows reductions in energy intensity uh, basically being offset, uh, the impact of, of what would be driving demand up GDP growth, uh, and what we end up with is slower growth in overall energy use, uh, where you have uh, total uh, energy use going from about 97 a uh, quadrillion BTUs uh, in 2013 to about 106 Qs in 2040. Uh, most of that growth in, uh, is in consumption of natural gas and renewable energy. The, uh, in the, uh, the oil area, uh, transportation sector uh, continues to dominate uh, the demand, uh, but there is a significant shift within the transportation sector uh, from gasoline, which we see going down, to uh, growth in diesel and jet fuel, so the, uh, the middle part of the barrel. On the natural gas side, uh, a lot of the growth in natural gas consumption uh, we expect will be in electricity generation, uh, as well as in the industrial sector, and I'll show you some slides on that in a bit. Um, coal use in the reference case grows uh, a little bit from 18 uh, Qs to 19 Qs in uh, 2040. Uh, keep in mind that this doesn't include the EPA, you know, 111D, uh, and that would uh, make a difference in these results. Uh, wind power uh, on the renewable side uh, is becomes the largest uh, source of renewable energy, uh, exceeding hydropower uh, by the end of the period. So we see a lot of growth in solar. Uh, and wind. Uh, nuclear uh, kind of stays fairly close to current levels. I uh, want to look here uh, at uh, net energy imports. So again, keep in mind this is energy uh, total. Uh, under different cases, uh, the net energy imports decline and ultimately end. You can see the reference case there in the darkest color. Uh, the lines do cross uh, out towards the end of the next decade, but you can see that most of the, uh, the drop actually occurs uh, a little bit earlier than that. So the possibility that the U.S. becomes uh, a uh, uh, you know, kind of flat or, or uh, uh, even a net energy exporter uh, earlier in the decade, the coming decade, is a realistic possibility depending on uh, a number of things that happen, and we can talk about that in a bit. Um, the uh, economic growth assumptions uh, will have a lot to do uh, with this, and so we, uh, as well as the choice of, of uh, oil price assumptions, a low oil price case, uh, you don't make as much progress on uh, imports uh, as you do under a high oil price case or a high resources case. Uh, CO2 emissions are uh, sensitive to the uh, economic growth and energy price trends. And in the reference case, uh, we're still below 8% below the 2005 level uh, that you see that uh, peak uh, towards the left-hand side of the graph. Uh, high economic growth leads to uh, more fuel consumption and uh, greater uh, CO2 output. Low economic growth uh, is uh, just the opposite. Uh, the reference case is uh, still uh, a fairly impressive performance in the U.S. to have uh, the combination of 
uh, both economic growth and population growth uh, and still uh, be able to keep those numbers reasonably in check under existing law and regulation. Uh, I, I mentioned the population growth and economic growth um, numbers, and here's a, just a little bit more detail on that. Uh, the underlying assumptions uh, here uh, is uh, that the energy use per dollar of GDP uh, declines at about 2 percent per year over the forecast period. Uh, energy use per capita declines at just a little under a half a percent per year. Uh, the uh, U.S., the underlying assumption for GDP growth is at about 2.4 percent per year, but in the high economic growth case, uh, you uh, end up uh, having GDP at uh, 2.9 percent per year, and uh, that results in uh, somewhat greater uh, output. So. Uh, one of the things, uh, this is the advertising section of the presentation today. Um, we have uh, uh, built and provided for your use uh, a, a new set of table browsers. We started with coal. Uh, we extended that to uh, other fuels and areas in the EIA website. The, the table browsers are really easy to use uh, to uh, make the data, in a sense, come to life uh, with graphics, uh, interactive, a lot of choices and scales and, and units that you want to show. And uh, the AEO has always had a table browser, but this year it's in the new version of our table browsers, and so it's going to be uh, very easy for everybody uh, to look at all of these cases uh, and the data uh, and, uh, and graph them. Uh, for uh, uh, kind of a help and aid in understanding what's going on. The uh, thing I'd like to do now is first talk a little bit more detail about petroleum, uh, and then we'll look at natural gas, and then the third thing uh, will be electricity, and, uh, and then, Frank, that'll, uh, that'll do it, and, and we'll be happy to, to, uh, to take questions. But let's look at the petroleum numbers. Uh, in a little bit more detail. Uh, what you see here is a high oil price case, a low oil price case, and a high resources case. Uh, the biggest differences, of course, are in the high oil price and low oil price case for um, how we, how we uh, made the assumptions or how the assumptions came out of the model in terms of, of trying to make some sense of this. Um, the reference case, uh, as I said earlier, is not a whole lot different in the long uh, run uh, from uh, what we had assumed before, uh, but it's lower in the front end. The low oil price case basically assumes that prices stay kind of where they are now. The high oil price case kind of has them jumping uh, from where they had been a year ago at $100 to moving up fairly sharply um, uh, all the way uh, up to over $200 a barrel. Um, if that uh, range seems wide to you, and particularly to the upside, I would just remind you that we were at $150 a barrel in 2008, uh, and there are plenty of geopolitical events that I'm sure uh, you, uh, you know, could come up with your own scenarios for how prices uh, could go very high uh, in a hurry. So I think the way to think about this is a stress test. Right? This isn't a forecast for where prices are going to go as much as it is, let's take a look at the ranges that we, we think make some sense and then try to understand uh, what that means across uh, the, uh, the energy data uh, to, uh, uh, it, it, as uh, the, the stress test cases against which you run uh, the reference case. So let's take a look at at what a difference the high oil and gas resource case or the low oil resource case makes, for example, in production. So in the reference case, production continues to climb out through 2020. Uh, we get up to uh, about 11 million barrels a day. Uh, in the low oil price case, uh, we get close to 10 and then it begins to tail off. Uh, I think that the, the way I would describe the reference case is kind of a plateau. Uh, the low oil price case is a, is a peak and decline. Uh, under the high oil and gas resource case, production continues to rise throughout the forecast period. I imagine that this actually does a fairly decent job of capturing 
the, the, what I would think of the likely range of, of outcomes. We do believe uh, in the reference case that production uh, comes off a little bit after 2020. Uh, some of that is, uh, is the lower prices that we see in the near term uh, part of the forecast. Part of it is declining um, onshore uh, fields, so the normal production decline in, in the non-shale areas. Can I ask you a quick question? So on the high resource case, when you talk about uh, no new policies, which is kind of what EIA does, right? In terms of technology improvements on either recovery rates or how do you get there? Yeah. So, uh, Frank, one thing to keep in mind is that's a high oil and gas resource case, not a high oil price case. Right. And in the high uh, uh, oil and gas resource case, you get a lot of continuing growth uh, in tight oil production. So, uh, uh, better estimated ultimate recovery numbers in the reservoirs, technology improvements, and uh, closer well spacings, and um, the possible uh, addition of new areas, so beyond Eagle Ford, Permian, Niobra, and Bakken, uh, you get production Horizons. coming somewhere. And, and, uh, and Frank uh, mentioned the word horizons. Uh, I would put that as a subset to the, to the last comment that in the Permian uh, Basin, for example, the number of possible uh, horizons that you could produce from are, are pretty strong. Uh, that, uh, one of the things that, that I think that we are, we are still struggling with, and, and Frank, I think this is really good for everybody to keep in mind, is that the hardest thing, I think, of all of this to, to understand is uh, the, the pace an opportunity for step change in technology. We've seen that um, happen uh, before. And uh, it, we, we build in improvements in technology into the modeling, uh, but I think it's, uh, it, it is uh, not easy to, uh, to, to predict. Uh, I, and not easy is, is too gentle. I think it's impossible. Uh, to uh, predict the, the kinds of changes uh, that could take place. The, um, this illustrates uh, this uh, under uh, the different cases that we examined, some of the regional implications. So the regional variations uh, in both domestic crude oil uh, and dry natural gas production uh, could lead to very significant shifts in uh, where the oil and natural gas flows in the country. And uh, what you see here is in the high oil and gas resource case, you get a lot more in the uh, Dakotas and, and Rocky Mountains area, and that implies uh, the need for transportation infrastructure to remove that oil to where uh, refineries and or consumers are to, uh, to pick it up. Um, one of the things that I might mention uh, is that we, uh, I think it's, was it last week or two weeks ago? Two weeks ago, we launched uh, our crude by rail uh, data, and uh, we are now uh, at EIA uh, on a monthly basis uh, tracking uh, crude by rail movements in the U.S. from region to region, uh, as well as across the border uh, to uh, Canada. And, um, and that uh, data uh, is, uh, is, I think, going to be very helpful uh, for everybody uh, who's interested in these kinds of issues to, to have a look at. The, um, on the natural gas, uh, uh, excuse me, gasoline side, uh, I, I mentioned earlier uh, that, uh, and this shows tight oil production, you see the squeezing down of net petroleum and other liquids imports in that uh, dark uh, ink at the top. Uh, that comes from a, a combination uh, of, of issues. Uh, liquid fuels uh, supply uh, two main sources, tight oil production, natural gas plant liquids production. Uh, natural gas plant liquids production grows from 2.6 million barrels a day in 2013 to 4 million barrels a day in 2019. So we're seeing a lot of growth in this uh, very light end uh, of the barrel. 
uh, we uh, will have more to say uh, about uh, where some of those light ends are going to go in the refining system over the course of the next uh, month or two as we publish the remainder of our oil export uh, studies. Uh, speaking of net uh, imports, uh, when that number goes negative, that means we're exporting. Uh, we become a net exporter of uh, liquid fuels in the high oil and gas resource case, also in the high uh, oil price case. Uh, in the reference case, it does come down over the next few years, but then kind of levels out. Uh, the uh, reference case net import share, uh, which had been 60% of U.S. consumption back in 2005, uh, drops from a 33% number uh, on that uh, dividing line of, of where we start with the reference case of 2013, and uh, by 2040, uh, we're at about 17%. So the numbers kind of hang in that mid-teens level uh, across the uh, forecast period. I started off the last uh, slide thinking that I was actually on this one, um, gasoline. Uh, in the transportation, transportation sector, uh, motor gasoline use declines, diesel and jet fuel uh, use, also natural gas use and transportation growing a little uh, in this period. You see the top uh, uh, line is kind of flat to coming down. Uh, total transportation delivered energy consumption uh, holds at about 27 quadrillion BTUs uh, across the, the period here. Uh, the interesting changes are uh, that the motor gasoline bit down at the bottom of that graph is shrinking pretty rapidly, while jet fuel uh, and diesel uh, continue to expand. Uh, if you think about uh, the diesel area, uh, because that's the one that's changing the most, it's really strong growth in heavy duty, uh, vehicle miles traveled uh, that uh, are only offset a little bit uh, by uh, greenhouse gas and fuel consumption standards. The, uh, on the net exports, uh, there are three cases shown here. Uh, the uh, reference case, the high oil and gas resource case, and the low oil price case. Now, you remember that in the low oil price case, uh, you don't get as much production. Uh, in the high oil and gas resource case, you get a lot of growth in production. Uh, if you assume that from that last slide, the consumption of liquid fuels is going to be relatively flat, uh, in a sense, what, you're, what we're showing here is that product exports have to go up uh, if you're not, uh, under the current law and regulation, going to be exporting that much crude oil. So what we're showing here is uh, a, a very high growth in uh, product exports uh, under the high oil and gas resource case. The, uh, we can come back to that in a bit. Let's go on to the natural gas uh, slides. Uh, here we're showing the, uh, the price cases for natural gas. Uh, I think that the key takeaway here is that natural gas prices are going to be very dependent on what assumptions you make about crude oil prices. In the uh, reference case, uh, the Henry Hub natural gas spot price uh, in, uh, uh, rises uh, from about $3 now uh, to $369, uh, or $488 rather, in uh, still under $5 in 2020, and then moves up um, into the uh, high $7 uh, number in uh, constant dollars uh, by the year 2040. Uh, that's driven by increased demand uh, for both domestic and international markets, uh, leading to um, more production. Uh, but at uh, a somewhat higher price in order to drive the resource base. Uh, the uh, Henry Hub natural gas spot price is lowest, uh, as you see there in red in the high oil and gas resource case, uh, and uh, highest in the uh, high oil uh, price case. The reference case and the low oil price case, you get about the same amount of natural gas. The, uh, on the production side, uh, this uh, is not a lot different than uh, what we were showing in, 
in uh, 2014, three big uh, sources of future natural gas production growth uh, in order of importance, shale gas, tight gas, and Alaskan gas. Uh, the, uh, the Alaskan gas is going to be at least uh, is among uh, the others up here is going to be very dependent on what the oil price is uh, because the Alaskan gas is assumed to go into the uh, foreign markets. Uh, one of the interesting things uh, in, uh, in this is that among the six largest shale plays, so let me just list those for you, the Marcellus, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Haynesville, um, the uh, Texas-Louisiana border, Eagle Ford uh, in southwest Texas, the Barnett uh, in uh, Texas, the Utica uh, in eastern Ohio, and uh, Fayetteville in, in uh Arkansas, I think, and Louisiana, I think across the border there. Uh, the Marcellus and Utica together will have cumulative production in our, um, uh, in our model uh, that's greater than the combination of Haynesville, Eagle Ford, and Barnett uh, over the forecast period. So the shift in gas, the center of gravity for natural gas production is really shifting east. And is it safe to say just under under price sensitivity, right? So the, while the volume of gas under high price case, low price case stays the same, the areas from which it comes varies, right? Because liquid rich plays versus dry gas plays, so some benefit more than others. Yeah. I, I, We're getting down a level of detail. Yeah, right? one of the things that I, I think you could say is that the, the uh, what we're already seeing in in uh, how the rig count is, is being deployed is that the uh, oil price is going to make a big difference to um, what, the, what happens in the Haynesville uh, and Fayetteville, Fayetteville yeah. and, and probably Barnett. The uh, consumption uh, side of natural gas uh, really driven uh, not exclusively uh, uh, by any means, uh, but certainly uh, the, the bulk of the growth and the majority of the growth in, in natural gas is coming out of electric power. Uh, there's also a pretty big increase in uh, what happens uh, in the industrial sector. Um, not so much in residential, which is, is declining uh, as a function of uh, better um, equipment, so more efficient equipment in homes. Uh, reducing space heating needs, uh, slower population growth, uh, the, the combination of electric power uh, use of natural gas and industrial use of natural gas, that was going to drive those numbers uh, up uh, pretty well. Uh, drilling down just a little bit uh, into the industrial uh, sector, uh, food processing, uh, bulk chemicals, refining, uh, and kind of general manufacturing and metals smelting, uh, big consumers of natural gas and providing a lot of the growth uh, in, in uh, this, this sector. Uh, I think it's, it's worthwhile to, to think about this uh, from the standpoint of what other than bulk chemicals is, is using natural gas because I think there's this tendency to think that gas is uh, outside of the, of the electric sector is going to be consumed by people doing petrochemicals, uh, but there's a lot of this uh, going into other areas like food and metals uh, that's pretty important. Um, one of the uh, key uh, differences across the, uh, the cases uh, is how much uh, natural gas is exported from the United States and uh, that's going to depend very much on what U.S. natural gas prices are and what world energy prices are. Basically, that spread uh, kind of drives uh, the economics of natural gas exports. In the reference case, we see those export numbers uh, climbing, uh, getting up into the, the, uh, uh, the mid uh, teens and billion cubic feet a day, uh, high teens maybe by 2040. Um, the uh, projections uh, change very dramatically depending on the high oil uh, and gas resource case versus the low oil price case. 
Let's just think about the low oil price case for a second. Um, with lower oil prices and the fact that in the global markets, natural gas tends to get priced at a BTU equivalent uh, to the oil, uh, the attractiveness of LNG from the U.S. is diminished and we end up with a lot less gas. Uh, one of the interesting things is, is that it's, it is really in the LNG area, not so much the pipeline exports to Mexico, which continue at a somewhat <laughs> lower rate, but at a, at a much greater rate than we have uh, in, the, in the current uh, situation. Um, under either of these cases, uh, we, uh, the low oil price case, uh, you uh, don't have the Alaskan gas coming in because uh, global markets just don't want to pay. Uh, for that, uh, it also doesn't show up in the high oil and gas resource case, and that's because the resources in the lower 48 states are more economic. Let's uh, talk a little bit about electricity now. Uh, the uh, graphic here shows uh, growth all the way back to the 1950s. I think I've shown this uh, before in presentations. Electricity use in the United States used to grow at a rate significantly greater than the annual growth rates in GDP or the economy. Uh, then there was a period uh, basically from the, the mid-70s out into uh, the mid-90s when, when uh, electricity growth uh, was fairly well matched with uh, GDP growth. Uh, if you extend that out uh, into the 2000, uh, 2010 period, and then in our view out into the future, uh, we have electricity growing at rates significantly below uh, GDP. Uh, in the box uh, there in the upper right, you can see uh, the average over the period from 2013 to 2040 for electricity uh, consumption uh, on an annual basis is, uh, is a little under 1%, so eight, to eight, eight tenths of a percent per year against 2.4% growth in GDP. Four big factors that are driving that. Uh, first one is slowing population growth. Um, second one is market saturation of some of the key electricity using appliances. What would they be? Uh, air conditioners, water heaters, stoves, uh, dishwashers, and so on. Uh, improved efficiency of nearly all of the equipment and appliances uh, that are in place. Um, they uh, think about um, the computers that you're using, they just simply uh, take a lot less electric power uh, to, to drive uh, than what we've seen in the past. Uh, things like um, uh, light bulb standards and so on also play a role in this. The fourth thing is the overall shift in the economy to uh, less energy intensive industry. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty uh, in this. There's a lot of uncertainty in all of these uh, forecasts. Uh, the uh, the uh, efficiency standards for both lighting and appliances could put uh, further downward pressure on these numbers. Uh, just as an example, uh, there's a lot of progress that could be made in big industrial electric motors uh, if the technology or regulatory incentives were there to do that. The uh, Electricity mix, uh, looking at this uh, over time, uh, shifts to lower carbon options. Uh, I mentioned uh, in my uh, introductory remarks that re renewables and natural gas uh, taking uh, the uh, most market share in terms of uh, generation. The uh, share of total generation from renewables excluding hydropower for just a second, grows from a little over 6% in 2013 uh, to a little over 9% in 2025, and then uh, hits 12% in 2040. Uh, so those numbers are, are going up um, fairly uh, sharply. The, uh, there are no net additional increases in coal generation, uh, mainly uh, as uh, retirements offset some uh, modest new plant additions. Uh, similarly, in nuclear power, the share of nuclear power in total generation, uh, although it declines, uh, the capacity uh, is 
uh, which is a, a, about 99 uh, gigawatts in 2013, uh, is only, uh, is, goes up, uh, but is only 105 gigawatts in 2040. So we're getting uh, very close to the end here. Uh, a couple of more slides to go. Uh, let's talk about uh, renewables in a little bit more detail. You see the growth in wind, uh, solar, geothermal, and biomass here, but particularly wind and solar. Uh, you see the crossover point uh, between conventional uh, hydroelectric power uh, and the total uh, in 2013. And by uh, the very end of the forecast period, uh, wind actually uh, should be generating uh, more um, electricity uh, than uh, conventional hydropower. If you uh, look at the growth figures across the different cases, uh, reference case uh, against um, high oil prices, low oil prices, the resource case, and the low and high economic growth cases, uh, you get slightly uh, different numbers, uh, of course, in all of those, uh, but uh, growth in wind and solar generation are meeting a significant portion of the projected total electric load growth um, across all of these cases. Uh, so uh, wind and solar, and keep in mind that this is uh, using the EIA uh, standard um, uh, existing law and regulation. Uh, so uh, even without the extension of some of the tax credits, for example, we expect uh, wind and solar uh, to do pretty well just simply on an economic uh, choice basis. Uh, so Frank, that's, uh, that's basically it. Uh, the, the second advertising slide uh, is where to go for more information. Um, the uh, annual energy outlook uh, at the, uh, near the top of this list uh, is on the, our website now. Uh, that uh, browser will enable you to look at uh, a lot of the data, and I hope you all have a chance to uh, do that. And we will, uh, over the course of the next few days, have today an energy articles highlighting uh, some of the key features from the AEO. And, uh, and if you are not uh, getting the Today in Energy uh, feed uh, from EIA, I highly uh, recommend it. Uh, uh, one of the things that I, I think is great about the Today in Energy is that uh, it will show you um, some of the highlights, but give you links to allow you to drill down into, into more detail. So it's a very convenient way uh, to learn um, about all of the things that, uh, that we're capable of, of uh, analyzing at, at the Energy Information Administration. So, Frank, back to you. Adam, thanks so much. It, not surprisingly, it's uh, always substantive and, and, and data-rich when you come here. Uh, so while folks are absorbing what you've said, let me just kind of kick off with two questions. So uh, the first one is the, the interplay between the AEO and the IEO, right? So as you look on how this plays in international markets when you're talking about whether it's exports of crude oil or exports of natural gas. Um, there's external events, what happens in Paris, where we go with, with climate and emissions on refined products. Where would those products go if we shipped them out in the world when you look at refinery configurations? And I would draw your attention, I, I want to say two weeks ago now, we did a refining and export session uh, with Lynn Westfall from EIA, which was an excellent primer on refining. And since that time, you've actually put out one of your reports on what refiners could do to handle additional supplies of light tight oil. But when you, as you say, when you look at distillate demand as opposed to gasoline demand, that requires either new investments because the economics of the, the product shift, right? So it's not just the inputs, it's the outputs that you want to have economic products. When you look at matching up the two, and it's good that you actually do these on alternate years, but the role of the AEO that frames the U.S. position, there's got to be in the back of your mind, I guess, the, the previous IEO, the international outlook. But things have been moving so quickly that putting your finger on uh, where the international market is going and how the U.S. market is developing in that context has to be a difficult task. Can you talk about that, the complexity of that a little bit? Sure, and it's not just what might happen in Paris. Right. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, Geneva <laughs> <laughs> as well. Uh, the Iranian sanctions could make a huge difference to the oil price outlook, uh, and it could go either way. Um, 
I had an opportunity to speak with somebody this morning that knows an awful lot about uh, the, the sanctions uh, issues. And, uh, and this is still in the negotiation stage, and, and I don't think we know the, the outcome yet. A lot of people are working very hard on it, but if, uh, if we don't get a final deal, sanctions could get tighter. Uh, if there is a deal, uh, ultimately, over time, sanctions would come off. In the short-term energy outlook, uh, we, uh, we suggested that uh, there's probably seven or 800,000 barrels a day of Iranian oil that can come back onto the markets fairly quickly, and that could make a $5 or 15 to $15 difference in oil prices uh, back to Paris on, on negotiations on climate. Uh, that uh, obviously could, could make some difference, too, in the overall uh, global context. Uh, there's plenty of things. Um, one of the other uh, geopolitical issues, Frank, that, that uh, we remain, uh, I think, uh, concerned about is the possibility that oil production could be lost in some countries who are um, suffering uh, from low oil prices. Venezuela comes to mind, uh, Nigeria uh, and, and others uh, that uh, could have uh, big social issues associated with a lack of revenue flow. Uh, so there are a lot of th things like that uh, out there. Uh, one of the others, uh, you know, it, it's, it seems really easy uh, to talk about um, the energy outlook and particularly the oil outlook um, on the supply side because we're sort of used to supply being a big driver. Uh, but uh, there were, there were and, and supply coming out of Libya, so an increase in supply last summer, I think, had a lot to do with lower oil prices. But there were two other big events uh, last summer um, that, that are very, very difficult to pin down. And, and one was the, uh, the uh, bottoming out and, and rapid rise in the value of the U.S. dollar against other currencies. Uh, maybe that uh, uh, currency uh, effect was a signal uh, that the U.S. economy was doing pretty well relative to other economies, and particularly the Chinese economy. So I come back to the demand side. One of the interesting uh, things that, uh, that we will try to look at very, very carefully in the international energy outlook is demand in China, especially for transportation. And, uh, and that's going to be uh, something that I think uh, that, that we will pay a lot of attention to, and, and I hope others will as well, uh, because the uh, amount of information uh, on uh, that outlook, I think, is, is kind of thin. So. Uh, what we've been, been trying to do, so the International Energy Outlook this year, so towards uh, later this year, we'll have the IEO out, and this will be the full version of the IEO. Uh, that'll include all energy, and uh, Frank, we will, will, to be specific on the interaction between the AEO, uh, we now have a oil price path, uh, in a, a reference oil price path, and we have the U.S. reference uh, production and consumption and import export numbers uh, in there, and that'll provide the basis for uh, at least those inputs into the, the calibrating the science. international outlook. So then the one other piece, since obviously the near term affects the longer term when you go out to 2030 or 2040, this notion of the amount of oil that's going into storage if demand doesn't resurface, right? And so there's been a discussion about above ground storage versus, and we're getting a little off track from the, the AEO, but it, it's a, a common situation that you're running into now. And the notion that uh, some producers are storing oil in the borehole, and with quick cycle time, <laughs> they're able to uh, you know, case the well but not complete the well. But if you cycle that back on, the analogy that we've used here is the, uh, the bus boy, they're opportunistic, and when you see that the glass is half full, all of a sudden, you'll fill back up, you keep prices depressed. So as you move through 2015, uh, the price outlook is, is, you have a number of different price paths, but is there one that's weight average more realistic than others? The, uh, so one of the things that we now have at EIA that I think is very useful in trying to understand uh, this is the drilling productivity report. And that's uh, down at the very bottom of this list. I, um, I don't remember if I told this story uh, before here, uh, so I apologize ahead of time if I'm boring people. When I got the EIA, 
we published the annual energy outlook. It was keyed uh, for 2013. It was keyed to 2011, was it, John, I think? And, uh, and the growth in light tight oil production between 2011 and 2012-13 and was a lot more than we had actually in the AEO. So that the, by, the, by the time we got to January, uh, our AEO forecast for 2013 and 14 was actually below what was happening. Uh, one of the things uh, that we've been uh, spending a lot of time on at EIA is, is in a sense, benchmarking the start of the annual energy outlook to our short-term energy outlook so that we can uh, start from a, a better place. Um, what, I, what I said, you know, we have people that work very, very hard at EIA to, to get things right. Uh, we're in the forecasting business. You're going to be wrong. So um, throughout my career, uh, I, I've said, I've been, I've been wrong a lot of times, but I, I try not to be wrong quickly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <word> <laughs> so we now have, through the drilling productivity report, a really great way to help benchmark the, the, both the short-term energy outlook and the annual energy outlook to each other uh, with a pretty good idea of, of production. Uh, one of the interesting things is the DPR, which is uh, out now for the month of May, suggests that there are declines taking place in uh, crude oil production in the shale plays, in the Bakken, Eagle Ford, and, uh, and Nile Brara. Uh, I'm not sure, last month the Permian was still up a little bit, but I think even the Permian is now under pressure. So uh, that's a, uh, that suggests uh, to us that with a little bit of help on the demand side coming from combination of uh, economic growth, employment uh, growth, uh, and the drop in, in prices uh, might offset in the near term, in the short term, so for 2015 and maybe early 2016, uh, some of the structural Decline. declines in gasoline consumption in the U.S., and so we would see more uh, demand and, and a little bit higher. Uh, back to, the, um, to the, the benchmarking idea, we're trying to kind of extend this across uh, fuels and, and other parts of the, of the um, AEO uh, so that we, uh, we can use the best available information that we have uh, beyond, you know, when you saw those dividing lines, we're starting with 2013 as a base, but trust me, we're trying to be very careful about making sure that the 14 and 15 numbers where we're beginning are from accurate. are accurate. Okay, and then one other quick question before we open it up. So um, you talked about the various studies that... Uh, hold on a second. Okay. <laughs> uh, inventories. Cushing. Is Cushing, you know, is Cushing going to get completely full and drive the price of oil down to zero? Um, we actually had uh, a couple of Today in Energy articles on um, gas, uh, crude oil, uh, storage uh, numbers. Uh, I think the answer is it is full, it's growing, uh, but there are lots of different things storage, that can happen yeah. uh, to, uh, to storage. As Cushing fills up, the spreads between Cushing and the Gulf Coast will change. That might enable some of that oil to flow south, and there's more storage available in the Gulf Coast. And coming back to the uh, drilling productivity report, uh, the, it does look like U.S. production is starting to flatten out. That should help slow down the build in storage. And, and finally, we are now out of the refinery maintenance season, getting into the, you know, the full-blown um, summer uh, production uh, output in refinery season, and that should help absorb uh, some of the flow of crude oil. So uh, we'll see how all of that works out, but I think it's, it's probably um, too, it's oversimplified right. to just simply look at Cushing and assume that, that the trend in Cushing is going to tell you everything that you need to know about the short-term oil price. Well, and that's one of the questions, that, so the, the complexity of logistics and the timing when the U.S. was highly import dependent in the Gulf Coast, you would schedule deliveries of tankers, right? right. So you actually stored on tanker, and if you didn't want it February 6th, you schedule it for delivery February 20th. If it's coming out of the ground, coming down the pipe, 
then it's got to go somewhere. And so we're in refinery maintenance season. When refineries aren't buying, Prices you go have down. to find a home for it, right? right. And it's distressed. Um, the other question, since you're tattooed, yes. you have <laughs> um, the export study. So the, the timing of the next round of EIA studies, the refinery You know, I, th study I think we'll have everything out. done by June. Um, there are three more. Um, export studies to go. Okay. So we've done quite a few. I mean, we, uh, a year ago, we had the first light tight oil production growth right. um, projections. Uh, as part of the AEO, there are some new forecasts now for light tight oil uh, uh, production, and we will expand on that and do it in more detail uh, over the course of the next month or two. Uh, so that'll be one of the, the, the three to come. You mentioned the study that we just did a, a few weeks ago on what could refiners do. And uh, we're going to have a study out that, that will look at what we think refiners would do. Would they actually do. Right. Uh, there's what you could do, and then there's what you would do given the economics uh, and so on. Uh, the final one, um, I, I think uh, in, uh, in June, I hope early June, uh, will uh, involve uh, the impact on prices, uh, production, and trade if you have constraints on crude oil exports, as we do now, sort mm -hmm. of the reference mm -hmm. case, uh, or if you were to relax those constraints, how does that change uh, the outlook? Uh, so we'll, uh, and I think that'll be, I, I'm reluctant to say that'll be the end because I have a feeling uh, that this uh, is going to be a continuing um, discussion and debate in yeah. Washington. Excellent. Okay, so as we open this up for questions, we have three simple rules here. Those of you who have been here before understand what they are. It's to wait for the microphone when we have large rooms. Identify yourself and your affiliation, and to the extent you want to make a comment, they're always welcome, but if you'll put your question in the form of a question, it always helps us out as well. So we'll start in the back. <laughs> Bob McNally with the Rapidan Group. Uh, first, congratulations, Adam, to you and the EIA for another outstanding piece of work and for all the work you've done to modernize and deepen the energy data and present it on the website. So just to start with a comment of congratulations. And, and would you, uh, you know, like in, in car talk, would you please avow that I didn't ask you to say that? Uh, yeah, that's right, that's right. That's right. I want my $20 after the talk. So. Um, my question has to do with uh, what you think the implication is of Saudi Arabia standing back and saying, we're no longer going to balance the market for you. You have a price path in the outlook, but when you think about the amplitude of the range or the volatility in prices, what does it mean going forward if Saudi Arabia is really going to sort of hang up its hat? How long do you think it will do so? Thank you. Uh, so I think that that the answer to um, what the what the Saudis will do uh, is probably best answered by the Saudis themselves rather than me. Uh, I will say that uh, that uh, oil minister uh, uh, Naimi has said uh, he, that the Saudis would not act alone to try to balance the global markets, and uh, and I think that that there's wisdom uh, in that. I think what the Saudis uh, have said uh, in many venues is that the experience that they had in the 1980s when demand uh, was weak and, and uh, supply was strong uh, was uh, one that they do not want to repeat, where they were the only country that was really uh, trying to, to uh, reduce production in order to balance the markets. So um, could Saudi Arabia acting with other uh, key uh, players, uh, Iraq, Iran, uh, maybe Russia, uh, Nigeria, Venezuela, I mean, you know, the, the normal um, uh, players in the, in the global markets, uh, you know, would it work? Um, what uh, will be the path of, of uh, U.S. Uh, shale oil production? Uh, is another important uh, aspect in that. I think that the way I like to think of this, Bob, uh, is that we ran a, a really uh, interesting experiment in oil uh, supply elasticity with respect to price. And what we discovered was that at $100 a barrel, you get a lot of supply. 
and not enough demand. The U.S. alone, uh, there's uh, uh, one graphic uh, that's uh, going to be on the, uh, the website um, out of the annual energy outlook that shows the growth in, uh, and it's part of the STEO, I think, as well, too, in the STEO numbers. Uh, there were, the U.S. production alone grew faster than world demand grew in 2014. That simply wasn't sustainable and something had to give, and I think the Saudis uh, recognized that, and, and uh, so the, the rebalancing is going to take place uh, on the supply side from a lot of different sources and on the, on the demand side as, as well. The, um, I wanted to, to, to say before we get into the, to other questions uh, how much I appreciate the work of Paul Holtberg, who has been uh, uh, doing a lot of uh, the forecasting, uh, uh, driving uh, EIA towards getting this done in a timely uh, manner, and, uh, and Paul, thank you for your efforts along those lines, and the entire staff, uh, John Conti's group, uh, uh, John Conti, the assistant administrator uh, for uh, energy analysis at EIA. So I'd, I'd like to actually give Paul and John a hand. <laughs> And just to not add, add on to, to Bob's point, the, the notion, the difference, one of the differences between now and the 80s was the opportunity pool and the number of prospective suppliers that are out there, right? There's a different group, bigger group now than we've had before. So for any one country or small group of countries, it's going to make it really hard. You know, we, uh, we might have another crack at uh, <laughs> something. Uh, where is, is Howard Grinspect here? Where is Howard? Howard, are you here? Howard's in the back. The International Energy Outlook uh, that we produced in 2013 uh, had a, a two-page box in it that talked about growth in world oil demand over the forecast period to 2040, and it, and it talked about how much was left for um, you know, non-OPEC producers, and within the non-OPEC producers, how much was left for Iran, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia? So, Bob, back to your question. And what, uh, you know, in this analysis that, that um, Howard uh, spent some really serious time thinking about was what we found, essentially, was that if you had success in Iraq um, and, and a recovery in Iran, uh, that, there, that the Saudis would be driven to very low um, production levels in order to try to balance the market um, for crude oil. And, and I guess, I mean, I don't know if we, I'd have to go back and look at this again to see um, whether we said it explicitly, uh, but it was, this is not going to be easy to, to do. <laughs> um, and... And as a consequence, uh, you know, something might have to happen. I, I feel in, in a, to a certain extent that we had an inkling of what actually happened at the end of 2014 and, and 15 in the oil markets. It's just that we thought it was after 2025, uh, but it came true a lot faster and probably because of this enormous growth in shale production in the U.S. That was great. She waited for the microphone. <laughs> Anya Grigas, uh, Truman National Security Project. I wanted to ask you on your view on American LNG exports to Europe, whether you think uh, they will be commercially viable and whether the volumes would be sufficient to have an impact on Europe's dependency on Russia. So I know this is projections, but perhaps you right. can offer your thoughts. Uh, you know, normally what I would uh, do is I would call on some of the people who uh, have done that work uh, at EIA to talk about the details. Um, Angelina LaRose, uh, uh, who uh, would really be able to fill you in on all of the details of that, is, uh, is overseas right now uh, explaining that question uh, to an LNG conference in Europe. Uh, I, I think in general that the, the answer uh, that Angelina would uh, have given had she been here today uh, would be that the, in general, the more likely market for U.S. LNG exports is in Asia, not Europe, uh, just because of the, the 
prices, uh, but that uh, that markets do shift around, and and a lot of this is really not up to the United States. We often hear the question is, you know, could the United States use LNG exports as a foreign policy tool? Um, the U.S. doesn't own any LNG, so uh, you know. Is the U.S. stopping the export of LNG? No. Uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission uh, on the engineering and safety side and the Department of Energy uh, Fossil Energy Office on the national interest permit side uh, have, uh, have granted uh, more permits, actually, than, than in our uh, low oil price case. Our <laughs> are going to be used. Uh, so, I mean, that leads to some interesting questions. But, the, the, you know, in general, uh, could exports of, of energy, uh, whether that's petroleum products, uh, crude oil, condensate, um, natural gas in the form of, of uh, LNG or pipeline exports to Mexico, uh, will they make a difference to the global balances uh, yes, uh, and uh, you know, does that have geopolitical consequences? Um, yes, uh, in a in a sense, I think you could say uh, Europe might be better off uh, even if U.S. exports of LNG were to go to Asia, simply because there would be more um, natural gas on the global markets. Uh, EIA has twice uh, looked at the question of what the impact on domestic prices would be of levels of LNG exports, and I, I could, you, know, you could go to the web and find those studies. Uh, in general, uh, we do think that it could tend to uh, cause domestic natural gas prices to be a little bit higher, but it's, it's relatively modest in the, in the pricing outlook. It's the increase in LNG prices that comes, uh, in natural gas prices that comes from LNG exports is probably smaller than the error range in the forecast itself. Thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, my name is Jim Moore. I'm with the Laclede Group, a gas distributor in uh, St. Louis, Kansas City, and uh, Birmingham. Uh, so bring it back domestic. Uh, thank you for the numbers. I use them all the time. I really appreciate it. Uh, and I was looking at the difference. My question involves the price of natural gas and electricity to residential consumers in the United States. And I've I had some problems with the numbers, so I went back to 1998. I would have gone back further, but 97 you used Lotus 123, and I can't open that anymore. Uh, so I'd encourage you to uh, translate the old files if you could. But I looked at the uh, electricity forecast, and almost every single year you've under forecast the actual price. So you've had to adjust the curve up every single, not every year, but almost every year. Natural gas, on the other hand, for the past 10 years, almost every year, you'd have, have had to shift the, get the curve down. Uh, again, on the forecast, if you look out, you're escalating in uh, electricity at a much lower rate than gas. So my question is, do you look at your older forecast and try to reconcile them, and will you look to improve that in the future? Thank you. Uh, well, in general, we do. In fact, uh, somewhere on our website, um, and it's part of the, it'll be part of the full version of the annual energy outlook. Uh, we go through an analysis of, of how, we, how we did. Um, I think the answer to, you know, why natural gas prices uh, are lower is, is that the supply of gas coming from the shale formations has just surprised us along with most of the other people who have been involved in, in, in this. Uh, on the electricity side, I don't know. As the, I'm looking around for, for electricity people here, but um, I, John, John Connie, go ahead, John. Why don't you? I don't. I didn't think it was that bad, but <laughs> does that work? I'll, I'll sit down and try. So yeah. we have been looking at this for a number of years, and it's not traditionally in the generation aspect of it, but it's more in the T&D aspect of it. There's been greater charges associated with in electricity price than we were estimating. And we have looked at it, and we're going to continue to look at it. And I, but I think we've made improvements in every year, and we, and we, we think, of course, we're right this time.
time I waited for the microphone. Um, hi, Tom O'Donnell. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, do Energy and International Affairs. I'm based in Berlin now. I should say I, I'm here as a fellow of the American Institute of Contemporary German Studies to study uh, uh, American opinions about what's going on in, German, in, in Europe and Germany on energy. So the woman in the front took my question, so I have another <laughs> question. <laughs> Um, and that's to do with, there's a lot of talk in, well, Germany and Europe in general, uh, uh, because of the direction things have gone with renewables, the energy vendor in Germany, there's a very high price. And of course, business is worried about this. And okay, they're biting the bullet for some years and they'll have all the technology, but meanwhile, you know what happened to the price and the supply in the United States, so they're really stuck. So uh, there's a lot of discussion, both from this side and that side, about investments of energy-intensive industries in the United States, actually German industries, but others. I think they have like 40% in Europe, and I don't know, we have 10 or 15%. How much is that, in your opinion, real, that move towards the United States, both bringing things home and others investing here uh, in, uh, in, in more, because of that? Uh. Well, it's, it's probably Electricity is one area. Um, another one is natural gas. There are a lot of stories about um, petrochemical manufacturers wanting to come back to the United States to take advantage of um, lower natural gas prices in the U.S. relative to um, um, global markets. And, um, and I think that it... Uh, it's also possible that that's one of the factors uh, in the crude oil export debate in the sense that uh, some domestic refiners are able to take advantage of lower domestic crude oil prices uh, to um, sell products into the global markets. Uh, that uh, all of those things um, are big, complicated trade issues and whether that alone is enough to make a difference to, you know, to the decision as to whether you come back uh, or not, I think, uh, is, is worth examining. Uh, there are lots of other uh, regulatory issues and labor issues that might go the other way compared to the cost of natural resources. Uh, so I don't think that there's an easy answer to your question. Uh, there certainly is a lot of anecdotal evidence, though, that low energy prices uh, have been a uh, fairly significant driver of GDP growth in the U.S. since 2008. Ben. Hi, Ben Schlesinger. Uh, so echoing congratulations to you and John, Paul, Everybody on your team, this is a phenomenal piece of work. It gets you, better ben. every year. Gets better. Um, so people who look at natural gas markets closely, and this brings it back to a regional continental base, but not totally, see a couple of things. We see uh, a rash of contracts for LNG indexing Henry Hub, uh, which, is, which is okay. That's what they want to do. Then we look at Henry Hub, and we see that liquidity is absolutely nosediving, that there's very little liquidity. Um, during certain times of the year, and increasingly so, uh, at Henry Hub. And uh, while there's an increase in liquidity in some of the high-producing regions, particularly in the Marcellus, Dominion, and some others, I notice there's some regionality. There's some regional, there is a, there's kind of a regional gas forecast uh, as part of the model, but I don't see it really highlighted. I think there's only three or four or five regions that are included. Do you have plans to try to, um, pick up on some of the regionality we see in some other models like the, you know, the old North American regional gas model, uh, world gas trade. Uh, uh, Better? There we go. Now it's working. Okay. It's working. Something's working. Uh, regional uh, differences in the model. So one of the things, I think it's a great question, Ben. Uh, it's on our priority list for the uh, fiscal year 2016 to do uh, a deeper dive into regional um, production 
uh, transportation and use, uh, you know, across the the, um, the entire suite of products from uh, EIA. Uh, we made a start at that um, with the uh, crude by rail transportation statistics, just as an example. Uh, we had a fairly big air terms in uh, the difference between production and uh, refinery use of crude oil uh, in some of the PADD, the PAD districts. These are the regional um, way that petroleum is usually divided up. And with the addition of data that we're now getting on, on crude by rail, the air terms in our regional um, supply and demand balances have dramatically uh, diminished, uh, come in. And so that's uh, one way that, that we can do that. Um, you know, will we have better uh, data on, uh, on the production side? I think we will have a lot more information on a regional basis because we now have permission and are in the process of starting our first collection of uh, new oil and gas production uh, numbers in something we call the 914 survey. This was something that started more than a decade ago at, at EIA uh, to look at natural gas production on a more timely basis. And uh, we uh, received permission uh, to, uh, from OMB to begin to uh, to do two things, to collect oil production uh, data on the same basis, including uh, its uh, API gravity um, characteristics, and, uh, and to extend the number of states from, I think, five to 15, you know, including the Gulf of Mexico in both cases, uh, so that we will be capturing oil production in North Dakota uh, and natural gas production in Pennsylvania and Ohio, just as examples uh, in, in regional output. Uh, I think we have some work underway uh, to uh, look at some of the regional refining uh, issues, and, uh, and our regional refining models, I think, are going to be improved. So there's lots of places where we can do that. Uh, one of the other things that we're uh, looking for ways uh, to improve our data collection is in the electricity area. Uh, we will also this year be starting an hourly data uh, uh, sweep, in a sense, uh, of uh, electricity generation, so an hourly uh, generation of electricity uh, database that's going to be available to everybody to look at it uh, that comes to the EIA website. Uh, the reason I, I bring that up is uh, if you want to know how renewables are really um, being used on the grid, uh, having hourly data uh, is, is critical. And, uh, and being able to, to look at that, uh, just as an example, will, will then raise other issues. Uh, how much solar uh, is installed on rooftops and how is that um, playing into the, uh, the electricity generation area, and we're planning on uh, trying to find some creative ways to measure uh, the amount of generation that we think is occurring uh, on uh, rooftops. Uh, very hard to do now, uh, and uh, you would think that that would be, it sounds like something that ought to be really easy, but when you look into it, it turns out to be really hard. I think in general um, that the deeper the dive you do uh, into uh, regional issues, the uh, more complex the analysis. I mean, in some ways, it, it gives you much, a much more accurate view of things, uh, but it's, uh, it takes more time, it takes more resources, and we have to, uh, like everybody, we have to prioritize uh, what we're going to spend our money on. So we won't be able to do it all, uh, but it's on, our, uh, it's on our priority list. Yeah, because the sequencing of dispatch is important to see what's peak versus base load at different times. Um, go ahead. Now, I was just going to say that the sequencing of the dispatch, as you know, is what's really important when you have the base load versus the peak load. All right, we're going to take two other questions, uh, quick questions. We'll give them both to Adam at the same time. We'll take one in the corner over here, and then we'll go to the far corner over there. Hi, um, my name is Andrew Miller. I'm an intern with the uh, Biotech uh, Biomass Thermal Energy Council, um, and I was very uh, heartened that you mentioned heating 
in your presentation because it's often overlooked. Um, and I just wanted to ask, uh, you mentioned that you saw it, I believe you mentioned that you saw it declining as a percentage of overall U.S. Uh, energy consumption. Some of the reasons why, um, and is this uh, because of a, a new use of technology? Is it uh, developments, the developments in CHP? Um, and where do you think that where do you think that's going? Thank you. Uh, I, I think that the story there is probably similar to uh, what's going on in gasoline. That uh, different regulations uh, uh, in the in the heating area and and just simply decisions that consumers are making on their own behalf about how much insulation they put in their homes, what kind of window treatment they have, uh, the efficiency of of uh, natural gas uh, furnaces, um, all of those things, uh, for example, I think make a, make a really big difference. On the oil side, uh, there's still a lot of oil being used in, in home heating in the Northeast. There's a lot of propane being used out in the Midwest. Uh, how the, those appliances uh, consume energy, uh, the growth rate in the housing stock, uh, the fact that from a behavioral standpoint, people, uh, you know, for some period of time, we were moving towards more and more square footage in houses, and it now looks like that trend is, is shifted. Um, so I think all of that's contributing to, to, to that move. Um, okay, and we have two folks here in the back side by side, and so I don't have to make the call. You can both ask your question, and Adam can pick which one he wants to answer. <laughs> Thank you. My, my name is Stephanie. I'm an energy reporter for Argus Media. Uh, I had two questions. One, when you mentioned the EPA Clean Power Plan that you might release a report in May. Uh, the rule is supposed to be finalized in June, so I just wanted to know if you can give some color on what you might release and if the rule is final a month later. And yeah, the second I, thing is okay. on uh, oil exports and the high scenario, high oil price scenario case. Do you think that the... Um, the exports can be met if we have to lift, does it require lifting the export ban? Um, did you have any thoughts on that? Okay, and then we'll go right next door. Thank you, uh, Davis Burroughs. I'm also an energy reporter with uh, Morning Consult. Uh, question is a little more open-ended. It concerns the um, import-export ratio. So uh, you project that uh, within the next decade, you said it's a realistic possibility um, that the United States could become a net energy exporter. So my question, is uh, first, how does that differ from previous EIA projections? Um, and second is, is how much does that really matter? Do you think that crossing that threshold is more of a symbolic achievement, um, or does that really hold a lot of political and, and economic weight um, as it relates to changing uh, the discussion on U.S. energy policy? 90% self sufficient Okay, uh, let's start with that one and we'll work backwards. Uh, on the... Uh, on the issue of is uh, being a net energy exporter uh, or net oil exporter uh, symbolic or, or real in terms of its impact, uh, I think certainly uh, the growth in production uh, and uh, how much of that can, can be met, uh, how that growth in production of, uh, across the board in all energy uh, has a lot to do with uh, GDP. Uh, so um, income uh, creation, and uh, that's certainly real. So the, the more things that we can produce uh, domestically, uh, I think the greater the impacts are on GDP. Uh, does being a net, um, you know, zero importer of oil uh, completely change the the Uh, foreign policy positions of the U.S. Uh, in many different areas, I would say probably not. Uh, the U.S., uh, anybody, even if we were exporting uh, a net exporter of oil, uh, the U.S. would still be part of the global uh, petroleum markets, and big price increases or price decreases would uh, affect the U.S. Uh, in the same way that it would affect other, other players. Uh, so there are certainly uh, economic effects that would be, you know, positive from growing our, our production. Uh, but whether uh, that means that we are no longer interested in what's happening uh, in the rest of the world as far as oil or energy is concerned uh, is, is uh, probably not true. 
Uh, I think that kind of gets to the second, uh, the, the export uh, issue that was raised uh, by the first questioner on EPA 111D. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, we will uh, have that report out in uh, May and uh, in time for the uh, Congress to, and other policymakers to, to think about uh, the issues uh, uh, and, and EPA itself uh, in the run-up to uh, implementation. So uh, in terms of, of what's uh, going to be in there, uh, we're going to try to, you know, cover the, cover the issues. We'll look at the economics. We'll look at the implications for fuels. Uh, but I don't have uh, anything more to say about that until we put the report out. Because EIA informs the policy debate. <laughs> we, don't, so, we don't want to become the policy <laughs> debate. <laughs> so one of the reasons that we get folks like Adam to come here and join us for these kind of discussions is we try to keep it on schedule because we know that they're busy. But thank you all for your questions. Mm -hmm. This has been an informative discussion. And join me, please, in thanking Adam Siminski for coming with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much.